Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear two students called Harry and Andrea in conversation talking about ways to handle the boys' personal stuff. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Andrea. The exams are over. How are you feeling? It's fantastic that they've eventually ended, isn't it? And every morning, more sleep. What about you? Well, I've also been sleeping a lot recently, but I have many things to handle before I leave for England. Perhaps you can help me with it. I've got too much stuff that I'm unlikely to take back with me. But I have no idea how to deal with it. Well, what kind of stuff is it? And do you prefer selling it or just giving it away? It depends. Uh, basically everything I have—the printer, the fridge, and other cooking stuff that I bought from the former renter. But my sleeping bag may be helpful on some occasions. But the newcomers have already brought what they need, so they won't be interested in what I have. And giving them away will cost me too much. I'm not sure how to sell it. Also. I've got some clothes and books. Why don't you just take those with you? The books weigh a lot, so it will easily surpass the airline's baggage allowance, and that will be another huge expense. And my suitcase can't hold the amount of clothes I have. Unbelievable stuff I've got during my time living here. Anyway, those summer clothes I have here in Australia won't be very useful in England. I understand. Well, there is something you can do. First of all, you can put up notices around the campus about the books, you know, in the student union building and the economics department. There are many notice boards, and also any places that second and third year students will see them. People always want to buy cheap textbooks. Good idea, but what should I write on the notices? Just list the titles and authors of the books, and also with the price you want to charge. Also, some basic information about you, of course, like your name, phone number, and also some little tear-off pieces of paper. Sounds great. And what about the furniture? You could try to put on notices about furniture too, but normally students won't be around all summer, so they have no interest in buying furniture now. You may also try a second-hand shop. The store will send someone here and give you a free quote. Then you decide whether you want to make a deal. But usually, you can't expect a really rewardable price offer. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. You can also choose to post an advertisement in the Trading Post. Have you heard about that paper? Every week it comes out with advertisements people place about what they want to sell, but you have to pay to have your notice in it and then wait for calls. Give as much information as possible, and if anyone is interested about your stuff, invite them to come by and check. But making a deal is always difficult. I haven't heard about the post before, but I should read it now, and I'll put the advertisement about the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture on. But I'm not sure whether kitchen stuff is also a good idea. Well, you can donate the kitchen stuff to a charity shop, or just sell it, like the Salvation Army or Saint Vincent de Paul. But maybe you can call a second-hand shop, and it can give you a quote first. 
Sure, I'll do that. Wait for the evaluation result and see whether I should sell them or just give them away. But how about my clothes? I still don't know what to do. A charity shop will take them too, so long as the clothes are in good condition. And although you don't get paid for them, you know someone who really needs the help will benefit from your clothes. That's very true. I'll put the expensive stuff, like the furniture, on advertisements and donate the clothes and kitchen things. Come on, let's go and buy a trading post, and we can write the offer together. Well, in fact, I'm interested in buying your microwave as well as fridge, depending on your offer, of course. Okay, let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a guidance counsellor talking to a group of students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Stephen, working as the counselling administrator at the college's counselling administration. Today I would like to talk with you about the counselling team of the school and the services you can be offered. Now three professional counsellors in our team here at St Court. They are Louise Bagshaw, Tony Denby and Naomi Flynn. Each of them holds regular one-on-one -on -one sessions with students, but you cannot start counselling with them until you make an appointment with Naomi Flynn first. Naomi is an expert in meeting freshmen and delivers a preliminary session in which she will tell you what you can expect from counselling. Also, she will ask you a few simple questions related to what you would like to discuss. For those who are feeling a bit worried about the counselling steps, this can indeed be helpful. Naomi is also the best choice for students who can only communicate with a counsellor beyond office hours. She's not in the office on Mondays, but she will start working on Wednesday mornings and works late on Thursday evenings. So, before your first class or after your last class on those days, you can see her. Louise is in our drop-in centre office a whole day. If you want to ask some counsellors for help without a prior appointment, she'll be a optimal choice. But do notice that if you choose this service, Louise will either see you herself or send you to the next available counsellor. If you want to see a certain counsellor each time when you visit, an appointment in advance is strongly recommended. Online or at reception during office hours are booking forms now available. Tony is our latest joined member of the counselling team. He's the sole male counsellor and has a solid foundation and expertise in stress management and relaxation techniques. Anyone who is trying to handle anxiety is encouraged to see him. A variety of techniques like body awareness, time management, 
and positive reinforcement will be introduced to you by Tony to help you address this problem. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Each term, there will be some small team workshops operated by the counselling team, which last for two hours and are all free to the enrolled students. The first workshop we offer is adjusting. For some people, college education is found to be a big shock. It tends to be simple to get lost after the structured learning surroundings of school. Therefore, what is essential for academic success will be shared in this workshop. As anticipated, this offering is targeting first-year students. Getting organised is the service that the second workshop offers, where we are active to motivate you to break off the habit of putting things off. We'll try to help you get the most out of your time and find out the optimal balance between academic and recreational activities. In this workshop, we're catering to a broader crowd, ranging from undergraduates to postgraduates. The next one is a communication workshop. If you've come from overseas, the way people interact here might be quite different to what you're used to. This workshop will recommend some ways of handling many situations to foreign students. For example, they might find themselves struggling on how to talk with teachers and other staff. It will also cover all aspects of multicultural communication. International students will learn a lot from this class, so we particularly encourage you to come along. But I have to say that occasionally local students can find it helpful as well. Everyone is welcome. The work called Anxiety will be available later on in the year and it will target something you might be familiar with. That is the nerves and the anxiety brought by the coming exams. Lots of students experience their entire academic careers like this, but surely there is a way to solve problems. Come to the Anxiety Workshop and you can learn several ways to relax and the proper way to breathe as well as meditation and other methods to keep calm. This workshop is designed for everyone who is going to take exams. The last workshop we have is the Motivation Workshop. The theme for this workshop is how to stay on target and be motivated during long-run projects. This workshop is only available for research students. Less advanced students already have some workshops dealing with their needs. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more information about our services, do visit us at Counselling Service. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear three students called Bill, Irene and Jen talking about their experiment preparation they are doing together. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully 
and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hi, Jen and Irene. You two are heading to class, aren't you? Hey, Bill. Yes, we are just walking there now. It's a little early now, though. We still would like to make some preparations for our apparatus for the experiment practice. How about walking with us? Come on. Of course. It's really great to catch up. How's it going with your experiment? Have you already chosen the subject you're going to test yet? To be honest, so far it's going well, and we're now serving as the laboratory partners responsible for conducting the test. Also, we've decided to test the impacts of, of the gravitation force on a variety of objects with a number of densities. Interesting indeed, but surely plenty of work for you to do. During the last two weeks, I've been thinking of and planning the test, and eventually did it yesterday. Goodness, Irene. Your hard work really left me with a deep impression. Frankly, I'm into chemistry so much, so for me, it's not very much like work. Whenever there is a little free time for me at the weekend, I'd like to spend it in the laboratory on my experiment, which almost feels like a second home to me. What about you, Bill? Which partner are you currently working with? Me and Kim, we were partnered by the tutor. I've never worked with him before, so I was worried at first that he wouldn't do that well in the lab work. But it turns out he's so capable. I've noticed that he's always very well dressed. Yeah, we share the same tastes in clothes. He's very stylish, but that doesn't keep him from getting his hands dirty. He works very hard and makes significant contributions, which I really appreciate. Ah, it's great that you and your partner get along with each other well, which I think will bring much more pleasure to your experiments when both of you work well together. What do you think of the other people in our group? Most boys are really good at maths, which is really helpful when it comes to calculations. Irene is also good at maths, so she contributes a lot because she can do all the equations. I am mainly responsible for all the writing parts, since she finds it difficult. Without help between our partners, we'd probably fail. It can't be too true, and I'm so pleased that we've nearly completed it. Only because you finished the data analysis. Come on, Jen. You give me too much credit. I'm so happy that Linda has not been my partner again. In the last experiment, Jen and I were grouped with her, which was really like a nightmare. Yeah, though she always submitted her part of the group work on time, she never took her phone with her, so it was unlikely for anyone to reach her, and vice versa. We were quite annoyed at her attitude, but she was such a hard worker in all fairness, because she realised the amount of work that would be needed to get a high score. Jen is so hard-working, in fact. She has been invited to work on the professor's individual project. Wow, really? That's amazing. Congrats. Do you know why he picked you? I thought that was just because I was closer to him. He told me that he was impressed with me always completing reading assignments in time for class. I bet you will be really popular among the other students when they find out. All of them want to hear about the project. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. You can distribute tasks to everyone, so all of them will get chance to take part in it. It actually sounds quite good. Could you help me decide who to assign each task to? Sure. Now, let's see. Well, Irene finds writing difficult, but that might be a good opportunity for her to practice it by reviewing the bibliography. Bibliography? I think maybe a bit too long for me, so the methodology would be a better choice. Sure, that makes sense. Bill, you said that Kate is a hard-working girl, so I think she could be given the conclusion part, as it requires plenty of effort. OK, sure. And I know that Kylie hasn't been feeling well recently, so she could be tasked with the abstract and the acknowledgement, for there is very little work involved. Jen, would you like to do the literature review part? Basically, there is a lot of work to do, but I believe you really enjoy writing, 
So I think you'll do a good job. Sure, sounds great. Right. So now bibliography and the discussion are left to assign. I think Linda will be struggling with the referencing, considering the amount of work. So perhaps I will take care of that task, and she could do bibliography. That's great, guys. Thanks for your help. I'll tell the tutor when he arrives. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a psychology student delivering a presentation about the research she is currently conducting on expertise in creative writing. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. I would like to present the summary of work I've done now on my research project, looking into expertise in creative writing. More importantly, I'm going to share with you the procedure I underwent to collect my interim findings. First, I think you should all know something about my relevant background information. Before I started my current degree course in cognitive psychology, I studied English literature, and as you can imagine, this meant I spent a great deal of time thinking about the notion of creativity and what makes people develop into successful writers. However, the idea for this research project resulted from a very specific course. I became fascinated with the idea of what makes an expert creative writer. When I read a well-known 20th-century writer's autobiography, I won't say which one at this stage, because I think that might prejudice your interpretation. Anyway, this got me thinking about the different routes to expertise. Specifically, I wondered why some people become experts at things others fail to do so, in spite of the fact that they may become equally gifted and work equally hard. I started to read about how other researchers had explored similar questions in other fields. I began to see a pattern that those studies which involved lab research were too controlled for my purpose, and I decided to avoid reading them. I was quite surprised to find that the clearest guidance for my topic came from investigations into what I call practical skills, such as hairdressing or waiting on tables. Most of these studies tended to use a similar set of procedures, which I eventually adopted for my own project. I'll now explain what these procedures were. I decided to compare what inexperienced writers do with what experienced writers do. In order to investigate this, I looked for four people whom I regarded as real novelists in this field, which proved easy, perhaps unsurprisingly. It proved much harder to locate people with suitably extensive experience who were willing to take part in my study. I asked the first four to do an SAT writing task, and as they wrote. To talk into a tape recorder, a technique known as think aloud. This was in order to get experimental data. Whilst they were doing this, a research assistant recorded them with video. I thought it might be helpful for me and my transcriptions later on. I then asked four experienced writers to do exactly the same task. After this, I made a comparison between the two sets of data, and this helped me to produce a framework for analysis. 
In particular, I identified five major stages which all creative writing seemed to go through when generating the genre text. I think it was fairly effective, but still needed some work. So I intended to tighten this up later for use with subsequent data sets. And then I wanted to see whether experienced writers were actually producing the better pieces of writing. So I asked an editor, an expert in reviewing creative writing, to decide which were the best pieces of evaluations. I was then able to work out which sequence of the five stages seemed to lead to the best writing. Now, my findings are by no means conclusive at this point. I still have a long way to go, but if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Are you struggling to finish your IELTS reading section on time? Don't worry, you're not alone. In today's video, we're going to share some pro tips on how to manage your time effectively and ace that reading test. Let's get started. Tip number one is skim and scan passage. Skimming involves quickly reading through the text to get the general idea, focusing on the introduction, conclusion and topic sentences. When you're looking for specific information, you should scan the text. Look for keywords in the questions, such as names, dates or numbers, and locate them in the passage to find answers quickly. Next, read the questions first before diving into the passage. By knowing what you're looking for, you can focus your attention on the relevant parts of the text. This prevents wasting time on sections that aren't important for answering the questions. A crucial tip is not to get stuck on one question. If you're unsure about an answer, don't waste precious time. Move on to the next question and return to the difficult one later. There's no penalty for skipping a question, so it's better to keep moving forward. Another key strategy is to practice with time tests the more you practice, the more comfortable you'll become with the time limit. Start by giving yourself more time to complete the passages, then gradually reduce it as you get better. This way, you'll become familiar with the pacing needed to finish in time. Using titles and subheadings is another way to save time. Many passages include titles or subheadings that provide an overview of the section. Use them to get a sense of the content and focus on the relevant parts that will help you find answers more efficiently. Additionally, it's important to know your question types, ELTS. Reading includes various question formats, like true slash false slash not given, multiple choice, and matching headings. Familiarizing yourself with these question types will help you know how to approach them quickly, saving you time. A well-developed vocabulary can also make a huge difference. The stronger your vocabulary, the quicker you'll be able to understand the passage and locate the answers.
Take time to improve your vocabulary for common IELTS words and phrases to boost your reading speed. When you read the passage, make sure to underline key information. This simple trick helps you quickly find answers later when scanning the text, saving you time and effort when searching for specific details. If you're running out of time, you can also skip the introduction. While introductions provide context, they often aren't necessary for answering questions. If you're pressed for time, it's often better to focus on the body paragraphs that contain more detailed information. Lastly, always look for paraphrasing. The IELTS often paraphrases both the questions and answers, so don't be surprised if the wording in the passage isn't exactly the same. Learn to recognize paraphrases to quickly identify the correct answer. By practicing these strategies, you can improve your speed and accuracy in the IELTS reading section. So start implementing these time-saving techniques, and you'll feel more confident when you sit for your test. Good luck, and don't forget to practice regularly. The more you practice, the better you'll perform.